Good morning. Welcome to Online Church. It's great to see you. Where are you coming from? Whether you're in your bedroom, your living room, your bathroom, hopefully not. We'll give you a warm welcome. You know, the Bible says that we should come and worship in spirit and in truth. Let's come together now and worship Him.
morning church welcome back hope you're having a good summer or as good as your uh, summer can be in the current um, conditions and stuff it's nice to have some sun and um, i know we've had a lot of rain as well but it's nice to have some sun um, isn't it hope you're doing well hope you're feeling good i know i say that like literally every time i talk whether it's before a song or before i speak but i really mean that i hope you're well um there's so much craziness and so much stuff going on um, I really do hope you're well. Um, welcome to my office. I normally don't record in here with the pictures of Oasis in the background and the caricature from when um, me and Becky were on our honeymoon and guitars and such. I normally record downstairs, but you know, I went downstairs to record and it was um, so messy that the amount of time it would have taken me to um, have tidied up just would not have been worth it. So I just came back up to my office this is it, this is where I work, this is where I exercise, this is basically where I live um, most of the time. Anyway, this doesn't get any more normal for us, by the way, speaking for myself um, on the camera. Um, the neighbours must think I am mental, singing about dead bones rattling at the top of my voice and then talking to myself. Um, they must think I'm literally insane, um, but it's Halden, what can I say? Um, Anyway, cool. We're gonna jump straight in, if that's all right. The title of my message this morning is Careful, Cautious Faith. Careful, Cautious Faith. So Matthew 14, 22 to 33, from the Passion Translation says this, as soon as the people were fed, Jesus told his disciples to get into their boat and go to the other side of the lake while he stayed behind to dismiss the people. After the crowds dispersed, Jesus went up into the hills to pray. And as night fell, he was there praying alone with God. But the disciples, who were now in the middle of the lake, ran into trouble, for their boat was tossed about by the high winds and the heavy seas. At about four o'clock in the morning, who else has seen four o'clock in the morning recently? Anyone with kids, anyone with babies? I feel ya. At about four o'clock this morning, Jesus came to them, walking on the waves. When the disciples saw him walking on the top of the water, they were terrified and they screamed, a ghost. Then Jesus said, be brave, don't be afraid, don't be daft. It's me, I'm here. 
Peter shouted out, Lord, if it's really you, then let me join you on the water. Come and join us, Jesus replies. So Peter stepped out into the water and began to walk towards Jesus. But when he realized how high the waves were, when he realized what he was doing, he became frightened and started to sing. Save me, Lord, he cried out. Jesus immediately stretched out his hand, lifted him up and said, what little faith you have. Why would you let doubt win? At that very moment, they stepped into the boat, the raging wind ceased. Then all the disciples crouched down and worshipped him. They said in adoration, you truly are the Son of God. I love that story. There's so much in that story. There's so many layers to that story. I love that Peter was brave enough. Peter had enough faith to um, jump out of a boat onto the water and walk towards Jesus. I think that's amazing. Um, I think what I find really funny, and I know I mentioned this last time, I, I find it funny that the disciples were fishermen. Um, and they keep struggling on water. Both the last times I've spoken, it's been about how the disciples struggled uh, in boats. That was their job, isn't that weird? So you could look at Becky going to work on a Saturday and having a really bad scissors day, really not understanding how to use scissors or everything's going on, she just can't use them. A really bad scissors day, it's the equivalent of that, isn't it? I think it tells us quite a lot about who the disciples were as people. Yes, they've got the fancy name of being the disciples and hey, what an awesome title to have, but I think it really shows that these are normal people, they're afraid, they were jumpy, and I think what it really shows us about the people that didn't leave the boat, everyone apart from Peter, is that they had a bit of a cautious faith. They had a bit of a careful faith, a bit of a cautious faith. You know what, sometimes I think I'm more like the disciples who wouldn't even get out of the boat. I'm a properly cautious person. I think if you know us for more than five minutes, you'll come to realize that I'm a little bit cautious, a little bit nervous. You know, it's funny, the first like six to seven years of being married, um, me and Becky went to um, Orlando for our holiday every single year. It was a World Cup year, we went a little bit earlier in May. If it wasn't a World Cup year or a Euro year, we went in June, July, depending on the football, of course. Um, but for those first two years, right, I would not step on a roller coaster. So you're going to basically the roller coaster capital of the world almost and I was too cautious to go on one and then through whatever circumstance happened we we ended up meeting one of Becky's uncles over there our uncle John and there was no way I could bottle out in front of him so that that second I think that third year kind of forces to go on the roller coasters but you know what even now when I go on roller coasters all I do really is complain about how the belt's not tight enough or how the health and safety isn't quite up to standard. I, there's a ride called Rip Ride Rocket and you have to get in the roller coaster. This is a roller coaster that goes properly fast, by the way. You have to get on the roller coaster as it's moving. I mean, if that's not health and safety gone mad, especially when you're dyspraxic like me and have any kind of situation um, to be clumsy, surely that's dangerous. I'm a cautious person. And, and what really got us thinking about having a cautious or careful faith was when I could hear myself talking to faith, talking to our faith. Um, it was almost like an out of body experience where I'm like, oh man, I'm like really telling her this. So it was like, I, I say stuff to her constantly. We were at Wall's End Park, just like a week ago. And all I kept saying to her was, faith be careful, faith be careful. Don't fall off that. If you go on that, that'll be too big. Just stay next to me. Don't run off. Don't go too far ahead. Don't do this. Don't do that. Um, and then we were at timeout for a walk, just like Friday gone. And all I could hear myself saying was, Faith, be careful. Faith, be careful. Faith, you don't want to do that. You might get hurt. She was literally walking on a bit of grass that was no higher than like a curb. And I'm like, Faith, you might fall down. You might do that. I'm like really cautious and really careful with faith and that just made us think that made me think that sometimes we are a little bit careful and a little bit cautious with our faith sometimes we're too cautious to even take that step out of the boat aren't we so here's a question this morning for your church could we be bolder with our faith could we be bolder with our faith? Could we push our faith from caution and carefulness to boldness? What does cautious mean? It means showing or practicing caution. It's an adjective. 
which means it's a describing word, I think. I don't want to act too clever. I did Google that before and I might have forgotten. To be cautious means to be tentative or restrained or guarded, hey? To be careful means that you're attentive to potential danger, error, or harm. It's harm, isn't it? Attentive to potential danger, error, or harm. So here's a couple of questions for you this morning, church. I'm going to be speaking on this this week and then next week. So this is a two-part thing. But for this week, I'm going to ask the question. I'm going to ask you to ask yourself the question. How do I know if I have a careful or cautious faith? How do I know if I have a careful or cautious faith? Number one. Everyone say number one. I put number one in your message. Oh, while you're doing that, I'll just knock the guitar off the wall. Number one. How do I know if I have a careful or cautious faith? Number one, I'm afraid to step out of my comfort zone. I'm afraid to step out of my comfort zone. Comfort zones are nice. There's a reason they're called comfort zones. Because they're comfortable. And comfort zones really nice you know what church this is not my comfort zone my comfort zone is not speaking it's not talking it's definitely not talking to no one I'm talking to a camera in my office which is a little bit mental I keep checking my laptop to see if my laptop camera's on because then people from work would be able to see us talking to no one but hey this is not my comfort zone comfort zones are behind my guitar i feel a little bit more comfortable there than i do doing this but sometimes and, and, and comfort zones needed, aren't they? I think we all need comfort zones, somewhere to be comfortable, some, somewhere to relax, somewhere to, to rest. But sometimes, church, our careful and our cautious faith will keep us in our comfort zone. Our careful and cautious faith will keep us in our comfort zone. Comfort zones are there to rest. They're not there to be tested or to be stretched. Comfort zones are somewhere to feel comfortable it's not very often you get stretched or get tested in your comfort zone. It's funny because we sometimes think, well, if I step out of this comfort, it could equal disaster. Look at Peter. Peter stepped out of his comfort zone. He stepped out of the ship. And look what happened. He sank. And we, we kind of convince ourselves, well, if I step out, I'll definitely fall. I think we can be afraid even to take the smallest step out of our comfort zone sometimes. It's like when cats are sniffing something or when cats are interested in something. So if we have like a box, an empty box or whatever in the corner for some reason, the cats do this really slow, really cautious, kind of sniffing their way to it, walk. They do a really, really slow, cautious walk because cats are really frightened to get out of their comfort zone and I think we're a little bit like that sometimes I know for sure I'm a little bit, little bit like that sometimes and I know during seasons like this when our normal is gone when our normal is completely gone it's easy just to sit in the comfort zone and like I said comfort zones are great for a season comfort zones are great for a night but there's no way we should live in our comfort zone we need to get out of that comfort zone so we can be stretched, so we can be tested, so we can go further in God. Maybe I'm being too careful or cautious. Maybe I'm afraid or don't want to step out of my comfort zone. If I'm one of those people and if I feel like I'm too afraid to step out of my cautious, my comfort zone, then maybe I have a careful, cautious faith. How do I know? If I have a careful or cautious faith. Number two, I only pray small prayers. I only pray small prayers. And right at the start of this lockdown, I am. Um, I read a book by Pastor Craig Rochelle. And I, I literally started the first week. It feels like years ago. It was literally March or early April I read it. And the book was called Dangerous Prayers. And it starts with this sentence. It says, do you believe God does miracles? And Craig's answer was, well, of course. And then the response from the person asking that was, well, your prayers are lame. Oh, imagine, imagine being told your prayers are lame. Imagine that, imagine being a pastor and being told your prayers are lame. 
Do you believe God still does miracles? And Craig goes, well, of course, of course I do. The response, well, your prayers are lame. Isn't that wild? You know what, church? Our prayers can be a direct reflection of our faith. I'll say that again. Our prayers are a direct reflection of our faith. How do our prayers sound this morning, church? Do our prayers sound small? How do our prayers sound? Do they sound like we're asking a mate to do us a favour? You know what, God? Um, I'd love it if I just had some spare time away from the kids. But you know what God's response to that would be? Get a babysitter. You don't need God for that. Get a babysitter. Oh, God, you know what? When this PlayStation 5 comes out in December, God, I, I, I would just love it if my, um, my wife would agree to me getting that PlayStation 5 without any hassle, without any questions, without any problems, without any compromise. Do you know what God's answer that is? Well, you know, maybe just save up a bit of money. If you get some chocolates, be nice, do some stuff around the house, give a bit of help, do a bit of that. You don't need God to be answering those kind of prayers. We don't need God sometimes to be answering the prayers that we're asking. Sometimes we're asking God for things that we could either do ourselves or we could ask a friend to do for us. You know what? We need to understand who we're praying to sometimes. I think sometimes we can lose sight of that. We can lose sight because our relationship with God now is relationship and not religion. That Sometimes that relationship can become so casual that you start kind of forgetting how amazing God is. Do our, do our prayers sound like we're asking a mate to do us a favour? Or do this sound like we need the almighty God. We need the creator of heavens and earth. We need the way maker, the promise keeper, the alpha and omega, amazing almighty God to do something that only he can do. 1 John 5, 13 and 15 says this. It says, I've written this letter to you who believe in the name of the son of God so you'll be assured and know without a doubt that you have eternal life. Since we have this confidence, we can also have this what great boldness before him for if we ask for anything agreeable to his will he will hear us and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask we also know that we have obtained the requests we ask of him it says be bold go to him with boldness go to him knowing who he is Go to him understanding who he is. He isn't just Jimmy from around the corner. He isn't just your mate who can do something small. He is the almighty God, the creator of the world. The, the one who is and is and always will be. The one who is everlasting. The one who designed and created this world. He is our amazing God that we can boldly go to. We don't have to timidly request something or timidly scale back our prayers i think that's sometimes what we do isn't it we become so casual and maybe so cautious and so careful with our faith that we we scale back everything down to this minute level request that anyone can answer for us but what i'm saying this morning church is that we we're ready to to be bold in our requests to the god that we we know can do all things we've already sang it he's a way maker a miracle worker he can do all things let's be bold in our request so i think we know if we have a careful or cautious faith by the prayers that we pray if we're only praying small prayers this morning and i'm speaking to myself church because i believe in this time like i say it's been very easy hasn't it to have scaled back everything scale back all our requests god i just want to be saved well lucky door at night god i just want to do this well come on there's some very realistic things we can do for those requests but but i believe we need to boldly step into God's presence to ask things that only he can do. Woo. Just preach there a little bit. Number three, how do I know if I've got a careful or cautious faith? Number three, I try to rationalize the outcome. I try to rationalize the outcome. I'd love it if you put your spellings of rationalize into the chat without auto-correcting it. That might be fun. Becky, give that one a go. <laughs> How do I know if I've got a careful or cautious faith? Number three, I try to rationalize the outcome. It's easy to overthink the problems. I've been in so many meetings at work where, um, where people go straight to the solution. It's like part of my job is to um, spot improvements, spot things in the data that 
can we be show improvements or spot things in the data that would show, well, if you change the process, then maybe that wouldn't happen anymore or maybe that would be better. If we change this, then maybe that would be better. If we change that, then this would be different. Maybe that isn't working because that's happening. So let's change it. But my job is not to get stuck in how the change will be made. My job isn't to get stuck in how that change will be made. See, if I get stuck in how the change needs to be made, it would sometimes stop us putting the idea forward. So if I have this idea and I go, well, the data has really shown that if we change this, then that'll happen. I don't necessarily know how to change that. And if I think, well, that that's impossible. So yeah, it would be nice for that to happen, but it's an impossibility that's never gonna happen. It's, it takes too much money, takes too much resource, takes too much time. That's never gonna happen. Sometimes that will, will stop us putting that idea forward. And I think it's the same with God. You know what, I don't have all the answers at work, so something that seems impossible to me is easy for a system developer, it's easy for a project manager, it's easy for someone that's had the experience of pushing through that change or making that process change or making that business change. And it's the same with God, that we can't solutionize everything. We don't know how to get to the end result. We just know we need to get to that end result or, or, or we need that thing to happen. See, God works in the impossible. If we try to overthink how we're gonna get there or how that thing I'm praying for is gonna happen. If I'm praying for that person to be healed of cancer and even the doctors are saying they can't be healed, then sometimes you can overthink and and, and maybe not even ask God for that thing because you think it's impossible. I think it, it can't happen. Well, we work with a God that works in the impossible. We believe in a God and we work with a God that believes in things beyond the solutions that we can see. We believe in a God who works always in the impossible. He's a light into our feet. And you know what the cautious part of this is? Well, God, I need more than just a light to my feet. I need a light that shows us the full way there. It gives us the roadmap. It gives us the Google map instructions. It gives us the sat nav. Uh, the cautious side of this says that, and that's one of the traps I get caught up with. It's one of the traps I get caught up in in my careful, cautious faith. I end up just thinking about the problem too much. I end up thinking about, well, that end goal is never going to happen because it's going to take too many steps or it's going to take this or it's going to take that when in reality all I need to say is God help me with this father I believe for this and you know what God will do that God can do that work imagine if like Joshua had thought about the end problem too much and never prayed that sun stand still prayer imagine if Joshua had never prayed that ridiculously impossible prayer of asking God for the sun to stand still it says Joshua 10 12 to 14 says this, the day God gave the Amorites up to Israel, Joshua spoke to God with all Israel listening, stop sun over Gideon, halt moon over the valley. And the sun stopped and the moon stood stock until he defeated his enemies. I'll repeat that, the sun stopped and the moon stopped until he defeated his enemies. God gave the Amorites up to Israel. Joshua spoke to God with all of the Israelites listening. The sun stopped in his tracks, like I've already said. I think I've copied and pasted this in twice. And it says in here as I finish it, there's never been a day like that before or since. God took orders from a human voice. Joshua did not have a cautious faith. Just Joshua did not pay, pay, pray a cautious prayer or a careful prayer. Joshua prayed a bold prayer. Joshua knew that he needed more time. He knew he needed more time, but he didn't try to end goal it. He didn't try to solutionize it. He didn't try to overthink it. He, he prayed it literally, God, if I need more time, give us more time. What did God do? God gave him more time. Joshua did not have a careful or cautious faith. Joshua had a bold faith and did not just pray small prayers. He prayed massive, ridiculous, unreal prayers and God still answered, hey? Number four, and finally, how do I know if I have a careful or cautious faith. Number four is when I do take the step, I can let doubt creep in. It's funny that we can stop backtracking on our prayers. We start to scale back our prayers. We ask that big thing. So we've made that little bit of a step in asking for it, but, but God, you know, if you, if you can't do that, I'll, 
I'll just take that instead. Or we start to scale back those prayers or we start to scale back those steps that we take. It's a little bit like Peter on the water where he, for a minute he had that ridiculous bold faith. The rest of them were stuck with cautious faith or careful faith, didn't want to get out of the boat. Whereas Peter, for a minute, just took that step, took that bold step of faith. But when he stepped out, the doubt, when he stepped out, the doubt started to creep in. Well, you know what, church? It's still better to have faith to take that step in the first place than be so restricted by doubt and fear that you won't even move. See, at least Peter had the faith. Even if caution did creep in, Peter still had the faith and to make those steps. But hey, church, I'm going to encourage you to, when we do take those steps, keep moving in boldness, keep moving in faith, keep moving, believing that. Because you know what? You stepped out for a reason in the first place. You stepped out because you trusted in God in the first place. So don't let that trust fall. Don't let that faith fall. Ephesians 3.20 says this, Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve inf infinitely, infinitely, <laughs> I can't even say that word. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all, for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. This morning, church, let his, let his miraculous power energize you. Don't let the doubt win. When you take that step this morning, don't let the waves win. Don't let the enemy win. Don't let the doubt win. Leave your careful, cautious faith alone and step into a bold faith. Let's not be too cautious for, of our faith. Let's not be too cautious with our faith, church. Let's have a faith that's bold. I'm speaking to myself as much as I'm speaking to anyone else. It's time, church, for a bold faith to rise up, for a faith that'll pray prayers of the impossible, where a faith that'll pray prayers where, God, we need more time, so give me more time. Let the sun stand still. If you did it before, you'll do it again. We sing that song like you've done it before, God. Will you do it again? This morning, church, let that be a challenge for you. So next week, I'm going to be talking about pushing our faith to that next level. Pushing our faith from careful, cautious faith to that next level. Three steps to move from careful, cautious faith to a bold faith. Amen. Like I said at the start, hope you're well. Hope you're doing good. Hope you keep good for another week. Looking forward to doing church again next week. Like this online, on the Edge website, on YouTube. Have a great Sunday. Have a great rest of your day. Enjoy it. Go for a walk. Stay socially distanced. Wear your masks. Don't fight an Aldi. I know from how I'm here. Represent. Anyway, have a great week. See you next week. Amen.